as Jim said, I'm going to talk about SRE, specifically SRE in practice. And um, when I was asked to speak to this, I'm like, well, I've been thinking for a while about talking about kind of what are the ways that SRE, that I see SRE being practiced out in the world that's, I'm going to call it the real world. And by that, I mean the world that's not Google, right? Because um, Google is just one environment. Uh, people have a lot of different cultures and businesses that have driven different needs. And so I wanted to highlight some of those ways where SRE can be done in different ways and you don't need to quite follow the gospel, uh, so to say. Um, before I get started, one thing that I'm not sure about is the audience's general knowledge about SRE. And I wish there was like a hand raising functionality or something. So just in the chat, uh, maybe a yes or no. Uh, let me know. Do you know, do you have a basic idea what SRE is? Um, I'll let people kind of type and get a sample. Good. I see a lot of yeses so far. So that makes my job easy. I can go through my introduction to SRE uh, pretty quickly and then we'll get into the meat of it. And if you don't know what SRE is, don't worry. Um, I try to fill in some of the blanks here. And of course, we have our panel to help you out. So site reliability engineering, it's the name of an approach to operations that, uh, as Jim said, originated at Google, but it shares many concepts with DevOps. Um, the core motivation here is to scale our reliability and operations effort efficiently compared to the size and the growth of our services. So the way we do this is by treating operations like a software engineering problem. Uh, when I say that, what does it mean? A few things. It means we consider the operational needs and the reliability of the service in the actual architecture of the service. Uh, we practice infrastructure as code, making sure things like configuration live in our source code repository and are subject to testing and rollout processes. Um, we make sure those are automated, as automated as possible. Additionally, we use data to inform our decisions. Uh, so for example, we're rolling out a new feature. We want to know, is it safe to continue rolling this out? Maybe we've sent it out to like 10% of our test users or something. How do we decide to continue? Well, we're going to use our reliability metrics to inform that answer. Um, if you've been in operations for a while, you might have heard the term BOFH, um, or maybe you have uh, like an uh, onerous code review process or change review process that puts roadblocks in front of even the smallest change. Um, SRE, to some degree, is also in a position of gatekeeping changes sometimes, um, but always with an attitude of constructive pessimism. Uh, that said, we're definitely a group of people who think in terms of worst case scenario. Uh, for better or worse, I swear that carries over into my personal life too. So the first SRE practice that I want to talk about are service level objectives, um, SLOs. Um, if you haven't heard of those, maybe you've heard of SLAs, service level agreements. Uh, the SLO is a key piece of data to us uh, when we talk about data-driven decision-making. They're kind of complex and I can't go into detail fully on, on like what they are in, in the time that we have, but there are a lot of good resources out there now. There's a Coursera course developed by my, by my team. There are uh, multiple books at this point. The part that you need to understand right now is that an SLO measures aspects of our system that reflect how reliable it is to the user. So if it's a banking website, for example, we wanna make sure that a user gets a login screen once they enter their username and password, and maybe a two-factor authentication, they end up on their account page. That series of events is something that we call a critical user journey. Um, once we can measure if the user experience is reliable, we can track that over time and compare it to a reliability goal. This is where people talk about five nines or three nines, et cetera, reliability. So that's what an SLO is. Uh, the part that I want to highlight here today is that this can actually be a pretty difficult task. Most orgs don't get it right the first time. Um, that's fine. So what might you run into? Well, 
how reliable does your service need to be? Um, we know it's lower than 100%, right? If, if you're listening to this and you think I'm wrong, I'll just challenge you. I'll say, has your business had an outage? Is your business still existing? Um, probably, hopefully. Um, so, you know, 100% too high of a goal. Um, but there are a lot of possibly correct answers here. Maybe you've negotiated a specific level of reliability with your users. Uh, maybe your service has been mostly reliable, except it fails on a handful of requests each day. Uh, you know, users probably chalk that up to their own network or their phone being flaky. Um, so you're probably fine. Uh, maybe you run a free service and your users stick around through multiple overnight outages because there's nothing better out there and you can't afford higher re reliability. You're not getting paid for it. Um, but the point here is that there is a notion of good enough and you need to get your stakeholders and your business to agree on what is good enough. But once you do, now you have this really useful data point to refer back to. The other thing I wanna say, sometimes determining your CUJs aren't very straightforward. The application might have a wide variety of users, use it in a wide variety of ways. Um, my advice here is remember the C is critical. Um, maybe you have one particular customer who's more important red pays more money than others, um, you might want to watch their reliability specifically, uh, for one example. The last piece here is one that's pretty common in an organization just adopting SLOs as well. Your dependencies might not have SLOs defined. So I know I want three nines of reliability on my web server, but what about the database that's run by some, some other team that's running behind it? Um, all these gotchas, this isn't to discourage you. I want to convey that you should try SLOs anyway. Um, without this information, you're simply reacting to outages. You also can't make decisions based on the health of your service, which often equates to the health of your business. Um, so just like one example, I, I was working with one customer on SLOs. Um, this was kind of the, the first customer I, I sat down with as I started working on Google Cloud. Um, they were really struggling with this lack of production insight. This is also a cloud native uh, organization, um, but they just didn't know what the state of their system was. My team and I taught a workshop on how to create SLOs. They came back to me a few months later to show off this dashboard they created, super proud of what they had done. Um, so I'm sitting there and I'm sort of lost for the first half of this demo because it, it didn't look anything like what I was used to. It didn't look like what I had taught them. The like time scales that they were measuring over were really short. The metrics that they actually defined the SLOs around just seemed weird to me. Um, I had all this critical feedback queuing in my brain as they talked, but I realized partway through like this actually had the intended effect. They created a dashboard that was easily understood by everyone from the you know, software developers and SREs up to the CIO. They had made it relevant to their business and they actually knew when they were down instead of waiting for customer complaints to roll in on Twitter. Uh, I wanna talk another, about another practice that I think has varied implementation in the industry, postmortems. Um, First off, I know it's a morbid name. And so for that reason, some people call these retrospectives. Um, I actually like that because hopefully our service didn't die for good during an outage. Um, you know, usually we get it back up and running and people are still using it. Um, so I use postmortem only because it's the common name for them at Google. Uh, many organizations will have some sort of existing incident review process and uh, it kind of reminds me of being a student and taking a test. Like you go, you get grilled on this topic, you leave the room and, and you kind of forget most of the details. Uh, at least that's what happened to me taking tests. Um, the piece of information or the piece that's missing is creating enduring value through re retaining those learnings that we had from that incident in some way. Um, and then defining and prioritizing action items that will actually prevent or mitigate the next outage and possibly even inspire us to create tools to resolve that next outage faster. 
Like I really want people in a incident review task. How can we automate the response to this? The other thing I do because Google does it um, is talk about postmortems as a document. Once I started talking to GCP customers, I realized that a lot more organizations conduct their postmortem or incident review process as a meeting. Both have their strengths. I personally like using a collaborative document, either like, like Google Docs uh, for this process because people can pull together key information asynchronously rather than being put on the spot and take their time defining remediations up until whenever that postmortem is due, of course. Um, this works for Google because we're very familiar with our tool and, you know, doing things like having a discussion in the docs comments. Um, but I do realize the value to real time interaction, um, the ability to have a high bandwidth exchange, um, the ability to sort of get that accountability to get people to speak on an incident in that moment. So I think this is, uh, very up to a culture, uh, an organization's culture. The other thing when we talk about postmortems is we talk about being blameless. Um, I think if I was interviewing somewhere, I'd sneak in the word blameless at some point during the interview to hear the interviewer's reaction because a surprising number of customers I talk to describe themselves as blameful, followed by nervous chuckles. So like I get the sense that these people's management chains really made them fear for their jobs. Um, and that said, uh, blameless in itself as a word has spirit, uh, inspired a bunch of spirited debate on blogs and Twitter threads. Uh, the conclusions about what the desired outcomes, though, of a postmortem are pretty similar. Excluding intentional abuse or neglect, we don't want to create an environment that makes people fear for their jobs. Or put more plainly, like we don't want to make people feel bad for what they did during an incident. Um, this can show up more subtly than just losing your job. And shaming people is a really good way to make them withdraw from the process. So we need to be mindful of psychological safety. And uh, there are ways you might adjust the process for your environment. One example. I'm generally not a proponent of capturing information like, uh, sorry, I'm, let me rephrase that. I am generally a proponent of capturing information like usernames in postmortem timelines uh, because it's facts, right? Like Eric ran command X at time Y triggering outage. I wish that had never appeared in the postmortem, but it has. Um, but I've heard a lot of teams have a policy to not name names. Um, even some teams at Google are experimenting with this in environments where psychological safety wasn't there. Uh, so all that said, I know either way, this is going to feel like a burden to the people involved. Um, and you want to make sure that you've balanced that effort so that people see the value. Even at Google, um, we've had people do tricky things to avoid being responsible for writing a postmortem, um, including just not declaring the incident in the first place. So there was this well-intentioned rule that every declared incident, we call them an OMG, um, required a postmortem. So what did people do? Well, they came up with a definition of outage that avoided having to declare that incident. And so it was like, okay, now you don't have to write a postmortem. Sure. Uh, nobody wants to do more work than they have to do. I don't fault the people involved here. It's the process uh, that needed to be streamlined and policies that needed to be clarified. Okay. The last little bit of variation that I want to talk about um, is how to arrange SREs, the people in your organization. Um, I think this is one of the most exciting ways that I've seen co companies differ from Google, not because our model is bad, but because what we do at Google is really just an artifact of Google's org chart around 2005. So I'll explain this a little bit and we'll talk about those variations. But at Google, SREs are placed together on teams 
uh, ideally containing at least six people in each of two locations. Those numbers are to make working a 24-7 on-call rotation easier, so on-call shifts can kind of follow the sun and hand off to the other site across the world at the end of your day. You're on call less than once a month, but often enough that you remember how to be on call. Um, the teams work in a, the teams are scoped to a specific product or part of a product. So there's map accessory, there's search accessory, there's storage accessory. Um, and we all report to one VP who can go represent Essary's viewpoint uh, to the product VPs. Now, not everyone can hire 12 software systems engineers to dedicate to one product or have a whole separate reporting structure. I get that. So sometimes you, you know, you might really just need one subject matter expert to embed in a development team for a little while and help them move to more resilient practices. You might be better served starting with one SRE team tasked with defining common tools and processes like a CI CD pipeline for the whole organization um, instead of just focusing on one product. So these are all valid implementations. What you should watch out for is how fast your SRE headcount grows. Um, so while we talk a lot about SREs as the guardians of reliability, I, I think our job is also to be force multipliers when it comes to engineering efficiency. So what that means is if we have a healthy SRE practice, we don't need to hire linearly with the number of developers that we have. It should be sublinear to that. It should be some small percent. Um, and our project work should be focused on making that gap grow larger. So this was like kind of a lightning talk. Like, I feel like I went through that so fast. Um, but what I wanted to do here was just um, place in your minds like some ideas about how SRE can exist. There's a wide range of, um, of variation that we see. And I'm excited now to bring on a panel of practitioners who can talk about their stories um, and answer your questions about how do you actually put SRE into practice? Um, let me stop sharing here. And could I ask the panelists to go around and introduce yourself? Um, we can go in maybe alphabetical order by, uh, what do we want to do? Last name, folks? Um, and uh, for the audience, feel free to start adding questions into the chat, um, and we'll run through as many of those as possible. Um, so, Ash, this is easy. Yeah, <laughs> it's easy. No matter which way you look, uh, probably uh, my name will come first. Uh, so, hey, this is Ash Agnihotri. Uh, I'm with Fidelity uh, for more than 20 plus years. Um, we are working uh, with the Cloud Migration Reserve, obviously, Financial uh, Institute, uh, trying to uh, put uh, migrate as many applications to the cloud as much possible. Uh, and we recently started uh, using uh, SRE practices, uh, and that's why I'm here. I'm glad to share my um, my experience and my, my knowledge that uh, I've gained thus far uh, with, with this audience. Who's next? Uh, Randall. Sure. Hey, everybody. I'll go next. I am Randy Lee. I'm a software engineer, which is our title, but SRE as a role here at Home Depot as part of homedepot.com. My primary focus for the services that we support is mostly bottom of the funnel. We have a vault secret implementation in our back end catalog and then kind of anything else that comes up related to security and so forth. Um, so our journey for Home Depot started probably about five to six years ago. We kind of went, as I, I tell many times and in, uh, internally, as well as some of the presentations I've given, we kind of started a journey for moving to the cloud 
as uh, you know, Ash, you guys said, and, and kind of Jim, I think, kind of touched on as well. Partnering with Google, we decided to go into Google Cloud, and I think at that time Google was kind of really opening things up, starting the CRE customer reliability practice. So we kind of started a journey to lift and shift everything to the cloud, to Google GCP, as well as start a SRE practice and shift from DevOps and operations type models to the S3 model. So we just kind of jumped in and just started doing everything all at once. Um, like I said, that was about five and a half, six years ago. We've had a lot of challenges and things along the way. I'm happy to share anything that, that you guys have. I think Eric, you've got a couple different topics there for us, but that's kind of me. And uh, Steve. Hey everybody. Uh, I'm Steve McGee. Um, I sound like I'm a podcaster because I got this funny microphone in front of me. Uh, I'm actually just an SRE. Um, I was an SRE at Google for about 10 years. And then I left. Um, I, I was a customer. So I, I joined a, a company that was transitioning from an on-prem situation onto the cloud. Um, and so I've been through the whole process of talking to all the vendors and all the consultants and all the uh, providers and, and doing uh, bake-offs and, and proof of concepts and, and coming up with a, an architecture that you think will probably work and then how do we actually do it? Um, I, I get it. Um, I, I came back to Google to, to help more people do that because uh, it is definitely a struggle. Um, so, so yeah, now, now my, my gig is kind of this. I, I, I talk to people about, about reliability specifically, but in the context of, of delivering a, uh, a reliable system on the cloud. Um, uh, I'm writing a book about SRE for enterprises right now. So this is part of my research. So you are part of the book. So thank you very much. And last but not least, Duwakar. Hey guys, my name is uh, Duwakar Pandurangi. I'm with uh, Sabre. We started the site reliability engineering journey last year. Um, when we started migrating a lot of our workload uh, from on-prem and other cloud locations into GCP. Um, so over the last year, you know, we have learned a few things. We have dropped a few things, but you know, we just, at this point, you know, we have found some interesting things that we can tweak to operate differently. But this has been an interesting journey. I mean, as we go through the questions, I'll, I'm looking forward to learning a lot from you guys who have started this journey much earlier than we did. Great. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, so I'll start with this uh, first question that we have from Kerry Rogers, because I, I think this is an interesting next thought on to, like, how did you end up uh, with SRE in, in your world? Um, and the question is, as an org learns slash assimilates SRE, how does it diffuse from diffuse, diffuse, diffuse from the technical implementation people right, who are just learning? to the requirements people uh, who want 100% <laughs> reliability. 15 nines is not enough, apparently. Does anyone want to take a crack at this? I think, I think the way I see it is like, uh, you basically want to set the expectation up front by producing the data. Uh, like observability is probably key here, uh, where you can you can analyze uh, and and set the expectation based on the service that you're using, uh, and, and each service will have SLOs and SLIs and SLAs defined. So based on that, you can build on that. Obviously, 15. Everybody wants 15 nines or P100s. Uh, to like budget, air budget to zero as, as much as possible. That that's kind of reality in the cloud. Uh, you cannot compare uh, whatever you get out of the on prem on premise uh, uh, where you have uh, everything set up, uh, compute network storage. Everything is part of the storage, and you're getting so high, such a high performance. Once you want to distribute that that, that those components in the cloud, expectations are different in that case, and that's where I think that's a key, like setting the expectation up front based on whatever services you're using and what SLOs they, they are committing or, or cloud provider is providing to you. So I'll, I'll kind of add to that. So for us at, at Home Depot, we started the journey probably like most with 
into an SLOS line model. We already had weekly KPI, and we still do, where we review all the incidents and metrics across all the different services that support HomeDepot.com. Along the way, we started to figure out that, yes, you know, we measured the things that are important, the order rate, the SLO objectives, and, and all those things, right? But really for us, yes, obviously we need to be 100% on Home Depot or as much as we can. We found that over time, we started putting the services in the tier categories, much like you would for any kind of dis, uh, disaster recovery, you know, gold standard and non. Um, and that kind of helped guide SRE as far as involvement and how many instances we need and things like that. And then we kind of evolved a little bit and we still you know, have all the monitoring for air rates and those have their own SLOs, availability, things like that, order rate and so forth. Uh, but it also comes down to you know, how reliable are your services and how can you degrade your experiences, right? I think here you kind of touch down your downstream systems, you're only re reliable as your your downstream, right? So we try to partner with, with everybody, right? Whether it's Google, their reliability, they provide us with the Google services and the way we operate, our workloads in the cloud, our downstream on-prem partners and so forth. We try to achieve 100% uptime, but obviously that's not possible but what we try to go for after that is doing destructive tests and seeing, you know, if service A is not available to us as an API, can we put mitigating, you know, can we cache, right? Can we put other things in place? Can we give some kind of experience to the customer, to our clients, that is some kind of degraded or some kind of, you know, response that helps get them, get the order, give them some experience, right? So it's not always about, 100% availability, but also giving you some kind of response, right? How how degraded is it, right? That's one of the few things that I always ask my team and everybody's like, hey, you know, when something happens, you know, I'm going to come and ask, okay, what was the customer impact, right? And then, you know, we'll go through them VPN. We'll probably talk about that here in a little bit. But for us, it's, yes, we have the SLIs, SLOs, we measure, but it's also what is the impact, right? And how can we mitigate that as best as possible through code or infrastructure as well? I can share a little bit about um, when we first set SLOs for, for Android. Um, so these are the, the Android services that your phone talks to, presuming, of course, you have an Android phone. Um, and th this, uh, when we first, we were actually, inside of Google, uh, SLOs were still pretty new. Uh, so not a lot of people really got it. Um, I mean, we didn't even get it. We were still just sort of like, we are calling them SLAs, and then we're like, no, they're not quite agreements. So we are still working on the name even. Um, but at one point, I remember going to, um, Kind of the, the head of the the Play Store and being like, look, yo, we're gonna we're gonna measure these things using this this crazy SLO thing, and he just didn't didn't like it. He's like, nope, not a good idea. Um, specifically, uh, what we were planning on doing was going to the product owners for each of the things, and so like you know for the Play Store, like for searching games, we're like, how available would you like to be? Um, and every time we did that, it was just running in circles, uh, because their answer was you know 100 percent. 19 nines, you know, whatever, whatever we can, you know, the best one. Um, and, and that's, you know, they're not making any trade-offs because all you're doing is you're asking them an open-ended question without any context. Um, so what we did instead after trying that a couple times and flailing uh, is, is we just said, we're going to measure our SLOs. We're going to, we're going to measure what we're achieving today and you tell me if they're good. Right. And so we decided like, okay, we're just going to say, you know, two nines or something like that. You know, are we hitting two nines or three nines or something like that? Um, and then we just didn't really tell anybody what we were measuring and we're like, we are within SLO, you know, dear business, do you concur? And they're like, totally, this is great. How many nines are we getting? We're like, don't worry about it. The light is green. Like the thing that we're looking at is good. And they're like, okay, you say so. Um, and that helped a lot. So at the end of the day, what we did is we said, yo, we're doing, you know, two and a half nines or whatever it is that we're doing. And you said, it's fine. So we're, we're going to go ahead and say, it's fine. Um, and, but the last thing to, to remember about this is, is when you're setting these, um, is you're just writing it down, right? You're putting it in on a on a piece of paper. In fact, it's not even paper, right? It's digital paper, so you can change it. So um, my suggestion is uh, throw a dart. If you if you can't actually come up with a really good reason, make one up, uh, try it, and if it's wrong, change it. 
right? So if the business is like, this is not good enough because we have a lot of support tickets or we're having returned merchandise or whatever, make the number go up, right? Change your target to be higher. Uh, if the business says nothing, try, try making it lower and see if you can get away with it. Um, and maybe you nailed it, but that, that, that would be my advice is, is uh, if you don't know and what you should actually hit, and every time you ask someone, they give you a crazy number, just ignore them and, and do your own math. Um, one final thing, uh, I, gave, I gave a talk uh, at a thing called SLO Conf, which you can find online, about SLO math. Um, and one thing that's like a, a, a slippery slope or like it's a common misconception is that um, if you have a front end service and a back end service, uh, the front end service has to have, or sorry, the back end service has to have a higher SLA than the front end service. Like the, the front end service depends on something and therefore it needs to have a, a higher SLA. Not correct. Um, you can definitely, definitely improve your, your SLAs in both directions, um, but you don't have a direct correlation. So if that were the case, like you'd have to have computers at the bottom of the stack that never shut off, right? But that's, that's not the case. Like we have computers shut off all the time. We have all these cool mitigations in place that allow us to deal with stuff breaking lower in the stack. So you can actually build more reliable things on top of less reliable things. And that's like the beauty of distributed systems. So don't get caught in the trap where you think like, well, my, if my, you know, my front door says they're going to have three nines, we got to have four. Like, no, 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 that's, that's not correct. You can, you can like a uh, Randy mentioned something about caching, right? Like putting things in place to allow you to kind of, you know, trick the system. This is, this is, this is actually called resilience engineering, right? Being, being able to have uh, timeouts in place and fuzzing and all these kinds of things uh, allows you to kind of get away with this. So, so don't fall in the trap of, of, oversubscribing yourself when it comes to to nines we started the journey um like last year so as part of the journey we're actually getting the product managers the people who have a say in this we're getting them involved ahead of time while we try and define these things so that they understand what the concept means what a downtime means and what do we mean by either slis or slos or slas that seems to help, right? I'm mean, going back to what Steve was saying, right? Give me the best you have, or give me all the nines that you can possibly hit. We're kind of moving away from the conversation and we're more focusing on, hey, everything comes at a cost. What makes most sense for you? That's what we'll focus on, right? And that is helping. And like, like everybody's trying to learn the same language, say the thing, same things, so that, you know, there's no confusion on what, what we are agreeing to, like what every team in Saber is agreeing to as we go forward in this journey. So I'd like to add just a few things if I could. So to kind of add on to what Steve was saying. So early on, as we were lifting and shifting services from on-prem to the cloud, we were saying, hey, this is what the SLO for latency or whatever was on-prem. This is what we're going to have in the cloud. And we tried to, as I, I use the analogy quite a bit, a, a triangle, right? So we have operations. We have the dev team that's creating the service, API, whatever. And then we have the product owner, right? So we... We try to get everybody involved in the process and figure out, I, I often say, you know, what are the things that you care about, right? Whatever it is that's pertinent, like kind of like what you're saying, Steve, right? Whatever it seems to make sense for a service or a thing, figure out what that is, and then, you know, measure to that, right? Figure out what your guardrails, your upper lower boundaries, and then measure to that. And then often we'd be six months, a year down the road, and then some big new integration, got to have new widget, whatever, got it. We, you know, find in testing, hopefully early on, that that's going to add another 550, whatever milliseconds. Okay, we think this is what we're going to see in production. Hey, everybody, this is what's going to happen. We go to production, and guess what? It increases a half second. Now our front of metrics are going up. Okay, we go back to development team. We go back to the product. Again, we're trying to include everybody in the journey, being transparent about our numbers. This is the cost of what you say that $10 million thing that's going to get us. This is the performance cost. Are you okay with that? Right? Us as SRE, us as operations saying, hey, we all agree these are the numbers, right? Got it? Good. Okay, now is everybody okay with this new watermark? Yes? You okay? Okay, if you're okay. We're okay from Messeria. Okay, we're going to go and update that digital paper, right, to add a new watermark that we're going to increase it by 50 milliseconds because we had to have that thing because it's going to get us the next $10 million or whatever it is, right? As long as everybody's on board with it, 
right, everybody's complicit, then, then you adjust it. I think that that kind of helped, you know, the data data driven approach kind of is what we say, right? Let the data do the talking and then all the emotions and everything is is off the table at that point it makes life easier for everybody. So one interesting thing uh, a few of you have mentioned uh, this like idea of SLOs over time and certainly when you realize, oh, we're going to violate our SLO. We need to take action. We either update that SLO or we, you know, do something in development to, so that we don't. Um, what about just like keeping SLOs alive over time? Like, do you go back and assess, hey, here's our definition of this. Reaffirm that maybe with your product owners. Um, what happens as new feature gets added into a binary? Do you have policy that ensures like, oh, hey, you know, dev team X, like they implement a new API call, they, they create a new SLO or how, how do you manage sort of the change over time aspect where when it's not reacting to some clear violation? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question to answer in my opinion, because we do we do like uh, this dependent dependency mapping, uh, and we have a good understanding of uh, what underlying services that are going to be used, and if there's a SLO being changed because of the feature release, uh, and to Steve's point, like if it is not hurting you, you probably don't communicate that way, uh, like uh, unless it is going to affect very negatively. But if it is like you know this is going to uh, going to cause problem, you basically renegotiate a solo, uh, uh, making sure uh, either upstream of services are doing defensive programming to uh, to, cap, to cope up with all those uh, deficiencies or maybe those lower SLOs that uh, the change is introducing uh, over the period of time. Uh, th th those are the some practices that we follow. I think that works great for us. Like if it is, it is, it is impacting change, uh, then you will basically renegotiate the SLO. Cool, thanks. Um, we have a couple questions about just kind of SRE teams in general. And so it'd be interesting to uh, shift to that. Um, the first question here uh, from Kenny is, from Kenny Khan, uh, is how do, you, how do your organization structure SRE as a centralized org or embedded? And maybe if you can talk about kind of the size of SRE in your org or uh, the aspirational <laughs> size of, SRE in your org? Let me, let me try this, right? So where we started in Sabre, um, we're following an embedded model. So we have some um, software engineers actually joining up with the, um, the site reliability engineers or mostly the operations guys so that both parties can learn from each other, right? Because historically we've been more a DevOps kind of organization where, you know, we were good on getting things done, but, you know, generally checking everything into get, making sure you follow a process for a script. Some of those practices we had to learn the hard way over time, because typically that is not something, you know, you, unless you come from a real software engineering background, that's a, that's a skill you don't just have, right? So for us, it helped quite a bit because what we have now is people who really understand the software engineering practices, but who also understand the coding practices, the services better. And they're learning from us how the infrastructure is implemented, you know, how we're making sure that the reliability stays high and all that. And we in turn, we're learning from them some of these things that most of the engineers are not very familiar with, you know, versioning code, you know, um, to a pull request, you know, how do you package everything and make sure you push it out, right? How do you make things consistent between environments? So I think it helped us greatly because as we went through this journey, what we figured out is why it was important that all environments were deployed the same way, put the same way together. Some of those things we were not able to do in our on-prem environment because, you know, there are always going to be differences in environments, right? So cloud was the first opportunity for us to make everything look the same, smell the same. And that helped, and then we understood how efficient it would make the software engineering organizations when you set things up that way. 
the same thing, right? On the other side, it reduces toil for the rest of the team. Because now I don't have to figure out like five different configuration implementations based on environment that floats everywhere. And that's been that's been a very good learning experience for the team here. Yeah, I can I can share uh, my experience here in Fidelity. Uh, initially, uh, when when we started the cloud journey, there became uh, some silos uh, within the views because uh, within Fidelity we have multiple business units, uh, and those kind of uh, those functions are performed by by smaller teams uh, and and very specialized. Like, uh, uh, for example, Kubernetes platform engineering team uh, or. or Somebody's running the CI/CD pipeline for for some app team B or A, so those teams are brought together, and we actually formed a, a, a centralized CRE a, a SRE team, uh, and and that's how the SRE organization evolved within Fidelity. So those when, by bringing all those teams together, uh, now we started that presented as opportunity to cross train and understand what to learn from each other. I think that's that's the key factor because of the those those. Uh, the, 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 those the, the knowledge is basically earlier it was diverse now you're bringing them together which is more effective and now we are going back to the teams again because I'm, I learned from team A uh, and I can implement the same scenario on the team B and and actually business businesses business units are getting benefit for all of that too so that, that's that's how we approached uh, the centralized team uh, which which is kind of helping us uh, um, share the knowledge and then we started building the center of excellence within the SRE just to make sure uh, somebody's watching those golden nuggets where that can be inner sourced and, and maybe um, foster the contribution model, right? So that it, it can be enhanced further, right? So th those are the things now, uh, those are the opportunities are presented uh, to us. So I think that, that that's helping us. So from a Home Depot standpoint, we, are mostly an embedded model where we have basically as a manager like myself assigned to a specific area of focus of the site. Um, from a dot com perspective, we have you know many managers with many groups of SREs, typically four to eight mix of associate and contractors that are supporting a particular area of the site from searching, from checkout, and, and all those things. Um, we We've been through different models of that. There are other practicing RE or SRE folks within Home Depot uh, that are trying to tackle on-prem and other areas of the business as well. Uh, one of the things that I was fortunate to get to do in 2018 was kind of go on a SRE evangelism model. Uh, .com had kind of been the, the steward, if you will, of SRE bringing it into the company. And I talked to many different teams across Home Depot and kind of sharing um, and, and I hear it even here that, hey, in, in order to be SRE, you have to go to the cloud. It's like, no, not necessarily, right? An SRE is somebody that takes reliability and some of the things that we've talked about here, the practices and principles, and they're also DevOps and they're also operations at the end of the day, right? But it's, are you adding value with destructive testing, performance, engineering, do you have the right things measured? Are you measuring them over time and being transparent, right? So at the end of the day, yes, we're mostly embedded model. We are discussing uh, several teams, partners of ours and other areas of the business. Should we do centralized? Should we have a, a center of excellence? We, we do to an extent. And uh, I also had kind of a fire academy or fundamentals and reliability engineering, which is really key to help as we onboard new people in the company or other teams were looking to kind of get their own SRE practice going and it really helped to get a set of documentations. Hey, go read this Google book and go read this, this thing here. And Hey, here's an internal WordPress site. Some of the things I did in 2018 to kind of help us all to speak the same language, right? What's an SLO, what's destructive testing and, and will of misfortune, all those kind of things that the Google book, right? The Bible, right? Kind of, kind of gave us and dot com started the journey, but it's helpful to, again, kind of share that knowledge, right? Um, whether you're embedded or centralized to have some kind of governance body, right? That we're all saying the same things and at least in the same realm of what we consider reliability engineering. Um, I, I won't just to follow that. I, I won't 
talk about how Google does its SRE teams because it's already, you know, Eric already talked about it and it's in the books and everything. And it's not terribly relevant unless you have 100,000 employees. Um, but like uh, I work with a lot of customers. And so I see what a lot of teams uh, do and what they succeeded at and what is working, what isn't working. Uh, and one piece of advice I can give is uh, don't be dogmatic, right? Like don't decide to go in one direction and be like, well, this is what we decided to do. Like we can't, we can't turn the ship. Cause like you can, you can definitely turn the ship. The ship is made of people. Like it's, it's fine. Um, so um, do what's, do what's really working for your situation. So uh, DeWalker mentioned something about um, like uh, some, sometimes you have people on your SRE team that um, don't have the same background as, as the developers when it comes to like, uh, like, I don't want to say simple things, but it's like, uh, it's like a daily practices. So stuff like uh, using uh, VS Code or using Git or, or um, just just working with um, you know an IDE and, and change control in, in general and any whatever flavor you have. Um, if if you're not well versed in that, and then um, you work with a team that is very well versed in that, you're going to have a mismatch in communication. Um, and often, if you just do um, like an embedded rotation where you spend six months with a team. Um, uh, any team may not even be the team that you're supporting, but you you understand a bit more about how they do their work. Uh, you'll help them. You'll help yourself do your work better. Uh, one one thing as an SRE is that um, I like to think is that is that you you really have carte blanche to have like a holistic approach to to, to reliability, right? Like you you've got control over anything, right? If if it, it involves making the system more stable, you're allowed to do it as an SRE. Um, the question is like, can you do it, and will you feel comfortable doing it? Um, and will people believe that what that your idea is good? Like, will you be able to convince people this is this is a good plan? Um, so, being able to be articulate in um, in like describing what you're going to do in in terminology that the, that your partner teams understand, uh, and being aware of their existing plans and their existing maybe even history, what they've already tried before in the past. These are all really important things. Like this is this is just context. So, uh, getting enough context under your belt is super important. And often that comes by just sitting, literally sitting with the team. I mean, you know, and back when we used to sit in the same rooms as other people. Um, and so I, I'd highly recommend that. Um, and then um, the, the only trick though is like the, the thing that you, you, you don't wanna run into is like um, when you have a, a team that is kind of too embedded and the, the SREs kind of get given the, the grunt work or they, they get uh, tossed like low priority work or, or they can't set their own priorities because the greater team is motivated by something which isn't reliability and they're told okay i know you want to do this thing to make the nines but like for now can you just blah 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 right um as an sre manager or, or a director or you know whatever as a lead of sre uh you gotta you gotta be on the lookout for these indicators uh, and you gotta be able to pull away right so you gotta be able to uh put your put your people into it into a into a group and if you see any of these bad signs like be on the lookout and, and do something about it. Uh, I think that that's really important because um, if you don't have an SRE team because they all quit, uh, you're not going to do very much SRE work. So uh, that's my recommendation. Yeah, we, we definitely face some of that as well, right? And that's something, like I said, as, as a manager, I'm you know cognizant of that and definitely keep my ear to the ground that, hey, you know, we're being asked to go do this and this and this. Like, no, that's, that's not helping the company do good SRE work, right? We're here to do good SRE work. Yes, we're going to have toil. We're going to have tasks. We're going to have things as much as we can automate those. So we can go, guess what, go do good SRE work that helps our customers at the end of the day, which helps us, right? So I try to enforce that model with the engineers and have them let me know, hey, yeah, I'm getting asked to go do this when we built a tool for the dev team to go do it for themselves, right? No, let me let me know when it happens and I can go help re-educate our partners, right? Well, yeah, that's, that's, that's important. Thing. Sorry, I just wanted to add on to what Steve was saying. Uh, like uh, being a, a sorry, doing all the, all the time grunt work is definitely very number one dissatisfied dissatisfied for, for the team. So uh, for that reason, uh, it is important to keep focus on the reliability and engineering side of the world of, of the spectrum too, and and if possible, uh, uh, use maybe separate board to track where you are reducing toil versus what you're doing for the business units so that you are actually progressing in the right direction. Okay. And so while we're talking about kind of what 
what SREs should be doing. Um, there's a good follow-up question here from Chet Barber, which says, I think this was in response to Randy um, asking, can you expand on that? Is it also important that SREs, or is it important that SREs also are responsible for the DevOps part of the job? Um, and maybe this is a, a good time to try and define, like, how do you view, um, I have in my head, I guess, an idea of what DevOps responsibilities might be, but I'm curious to hear from the panelists. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll go. Your question. Just go ahead, Randy. <laughs> Yeah, I think, Eric, what you were asking is, from a practice standpoint, what separates DevOps from SRE or maybe some of the tasks associated with each role? Yeah. Okay. So for, for Home Depot and the journey that we've gone on, um, we started off as DevOps, we were embedded, and we've kind of, you know, morphed along the way. We brought in a lot of folks that were very cloud native, maybe SRE or not. Um, and kind of where we are now is we we do all the things right I, I, you know as I was going through Eric the list that you had you know what do we do so we in general at least for dot com and most of the other teams practice as well we're the ones carrying the pager so anything that goes bump on the site we're operations first right we're the triage experts um, we also help bring a new service to market so that includes destructive testing and includes ARRs, application reliability review, sitting with our partner, going very deep on the application, understanding what its dependencies are, what those dependencies do to its clients, its customers. Uh, and then once it's in service, what are the SLOs, right? And how do we measure that over time? Um, and then destructive testing, right? So it, it's all the things, right? Just like uh, I guess you'll see in the Google book and a lot of other sites, you know, where we're the ones expected to know CICD when sometimes we're like, no, you need to go talk to the CICD folks in the enterprise side. You know, that's your pipeline, right? Once you built a package, then we'll take it from there. So we, we often have to remind, but a lot of times they'll come to us first, right? And sometimes it's up to us to go figure it out. And sometimes it's us, up to us to go point them in the right direction. So the, the ninjas, right? They know, know everything, they know all the magic. We don't, right? Um, so for us, Yes, it's it's operations first. It's can we provide the reliability? Can we do the thinking for a lot of our partners of, hey, it's not a matter of if, but when things are going to break. So have we tested that to figure out that, yes, I can take service B down that I rely on and there's no impact. Great. Let's take it to market. Right. So performance engineering, cost compliance, security compliance, that all falls within our realm. Yeah, I would I would kind of agree to that one. Uh, in fidelity, DevOps of, for SRE, it's, I think DevOps is, is is somehow assumed like you you already performing those and uh, operations first, DevOps first. On top of that, the other services that that are, are values that SRE brings brings in like uh, onboarding new uh, cloud service. So if if you're looking through SRE glance, any new cloud service, you'll find a lot of lot of opportunities before you can bring in that service into production. Uh, is that true? Service is highly available or is it what kind of logging, what kind of observability it provides? So if you look look through the SRE lens, you find a lot of opportunity and improve upon them before putting the service in the production so that you are getting a service which is really reliable and resilient. So those are the still add-on layers on top of whatever I think assumed uh, responsibilities are for DevOps. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it because we were doing all those things. What we did was add on to that DevOps, and I think Google, you know, implements right DevOps or SRE implements DevOps, right? Uh, we were adding in the the value add, and what I try to tell my team is like, yes, we have to go do all those things, but we also have to figure out, hey, if something breaks, where does it break? What does that impact, right? So that's the SRE value add is the reliability aspect and all those principles that go along with it. I think that's, for me, that's the clear separation. I, I personally don't like the implements analogy. Um, <laughs> like 
I'm, I'm reasonably familiar with object-oriented programming, and I know that if you implement an interface, it means you're responsible for all of the methods that are, you know, and and then whatever you add. Uh, and I don't mm -hmm. think that's the best model for SRE. Um, I think it's their uh, complementary. Um, I think actually an organization that already practices DevOps with its dev and ops teams, like not having one team called DevOps, but like practicing DevOps, like as a larger group uh, where everyone's like familiar enough with, with enough of the things that they can get stuff done. I think adding SRE to that uh, culture is is a much more powerful um, model. Um, going back to like the the Google model, like at some point in history, I don't know when. Like I think the 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 stat that we throw around is that five percent of teams had SRE coverage, um, which is a very small number, right? Like it it was actually a very large amount of traffic, but like um, it was you know the ones that that could afford it essentially. Um, so what did the other teams do? They don't just just panic. Like they 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 did DevOps, right? They they still did all the stuff. Like they knew how to deploy stuff. They knew how to build their own code. They knew how to edit Borg files, all kinds of stuff. Um, they didn't have a dedicated team whose only job it was was to make sure that you know the reliability went you know up and to the right. But they still did the job, right? So um, my my impression is that you know your org as a whole needs to adopt DevOps principles uh, and practices, and then. For the, the parts that need it, you you apply SRE, right? So you you sprinkle some some SREs into the corners where where they're, they're needed the most. Uh, you can't apply DevOps in parts of your business, like you can like generally speaking. I mean, maybe maybe there's a way to interpret this where you could, but generally speaking, like in order to get all the services out, you have to build them and deploy them, right? And so there aren't any services that don't get built and deployed. Um, so uh, if you're going to do DevOps, you're going to do them to all of them. So you wouldn't. Um, so I guess the, the way to think about it is like DevOps. You can you can smear like peanut butter, right? You can get it across everything. Like everyone should get some DevOps. Uh, SRE is you know you sprinkle something else. I don't know what you sprinkle on peanut butter, but it's 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 a different form. Like you only put it in, in the places where you need it. So that was a strange analogy. I'll I'll do better next time. <laughs> I, I I agree. That's where we are right now. When we started off mostly as DevOps teams, and now we are trying to learn these other things that are gonna make us better. Right, I mean that that seems to be the best way to capture what we're doing because at the end of the day, you carry the page. You're you're still expected to keep the lights on. You're still expected to make sure things are working. Yes, you are transforming a few things, but it is still your responsibility to make sure what is in there is is working as well as it could while you try and change other things. Right. So for the, the biggest thing that we find when biggest thing that we think SR is probably helping us really is, you know, prioritization, figuring out where toil is. I mean, once upon a time, you didn't have a prioritization. I mean, whatever the teams throw at you, you just have to get it done, right? Uh, I think those are the places where we are trying to kind of push the envelope to say, well, let's think of this as differently for a couple of services or for a couple of teams to see what we can get there so that we can take some learnings then move forward to the next one. Um, that, that that seems to work well so far. Thanks. Cool. Let's move on. Um, there's a question here from uh, Ramji Bala. Um, and I have one person in mind who might be a good person to answer this. But the question is, uh, if you were to do a gap analysis between what a, a legacy operations team does versus a high performing SRE team. How would you go about it? So I guess um, I actually haven't seen this, but uh, Jez Humble authored a CICD maturity matrix. Um, so the question is, is there one for SRE? And I think I'll interject the side question of, do you think there should be one? Uh, do you assess team's maturity in your org? Yes, right. I mean, you want to, right? You want to see where you are in the journey and see if you're really making a difference, right? I mean, that that definitely is the answer, right? You have to measure, right? I mean, if, if it is all about data-driven decisions, well, then you have to measure, right? You have to say, okay, is, is the team really going in the direction you want them to go, right? So I agree there are gaps and I think, you know, we should look at it closely on what the gaps are and see if we can probably, I don't want to use analogies, right? But it's basically saying, are you doing things better? 
or you know is the team burnout ratio right has that gone down i mean are you not putting people on paging all the time it's, there are there are things that you can measure that actually say here is what we used to do six months back and after we introduced these processes here are how things have improved right or you know some of the engineers now they say hey you know, i actually have downtime i can go learn something new or develop something new right i I think it helps. I mean, we have to measure, right? I mean, that's the only way you can make the course corrections you need. That's what I think. I have a divergent opinion slightly. Like, um, I, I agree 100%. Uh, you need to measure things and you need to set goals. Um, I think the the phrase maturity matrix is is very loaded. Um, I, I'd like to uh, offer this you know, criticism, like uh, if you, if you say we have a, we have a maturity matrix and, you know, one is immature and five is mature. And then you go and put this in front of a director. What are the, what are they going to pick? Like, what should our goal be? Three? No, five. It's always five. Um, is five always appropriate? No, not when it comes to reliability. So uh, if we have the, the system, again, it goes back to the same thing with the chocolate chips and peanut butter, whatever it is. Or like, um, the, the the problem with calling it a maturity matrix is because is is that it it's just a bad word. Um, I think if you call it like a some something else like a, a system of capabilities where you can increase your capabilities over time, and you use your um, uh, you kind of leave the the judge uh, how many capabilities you're kind of succeeding at to be independent of of. Uh, or, or sorry, to, to be dependent on like your, your customer's satisfaction. Um, it's a lot better. Like I would much rather have a immature team that is running a very satisfying service, right? Like I don't want to invest a ton of information, a ton of um, money and time in, in building like this, um, this elaborate contraption to make the system that was already, everyone was already cool with, right? So the, the two, the two parts that are important are like, are customers happy and are, are the team happy? So as long as like toil levels are low and people are like satisfied with their jobs, um, there's no need to make it tick more boxes and get more mature. Like let's just let's just leave it, you know. Um, so so that's that's my only um, observation around that is that the word maturity is really loaded. So I would actually stray away from it. Yeah, I, I agree with everything else. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean I'll I'll just go further into what you were saying, Stephen. You said like have a number one to five. So admittedly, this is how Google was doing it for a while, right? Like we did have a maturity matrix. I filled out that that spreadsheet also. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. When I managed an SRE team, it was uh, so we have a, a team review for various SRE teams. We call it products or production excellence, and it used to be that you were graded along this maturity matrix. And really, what we discovered is exactly what Steve said. You don't need to be fives in everything. Um, why are we doing this? Why would you spend the money on trying to do that to reach those levels if you didn't need to? Um, so if I word this another way though, how do we look at the continuum of um, uh, the journey from a legacy operations team to high functioning, let's say SRE team? Um, is that something that we can do incrementally? Or do you think it requires a, a shift like, hey, we're adopting all these new practices right away? Yeah, so I think incremental approach definitely helps. And to back to the maturity, yeah, because if you if you set those those uh, those targets, people are going to find a ways and cut the corners and get the five numbers just to satisfy directors or whoever is looking at those numbers. So to do it incrementally, I think like cultural shift is something that is that is very important. Uh, uh, how how you close that gap uh, by maybe upscaling your existing staff, making sure your you know your cloud journey, you identify uh, your, uh, the skill set that you need to go from point A to point B, and then you are giving um, enough opportunities to the team, making sure they are having learning days. So as part of fidelity, like we. Uh, there's a one learning day resort for in, in each uh, split, right? Because you get to pick your topic, learn whatever you want. At least that way you are closing the gap, uh, making sure uh, whatever makes sense to contribute more in this area, we are able to learn those skills. And hiring the right people also, that's, that's also is very important, right? 
uh, uh, I would rather have a right uh, team player compared to the heavy technical technical person, which is not a team player, right? So ha having a right team with the with the right attitude, which is also very important, where the sharing is a culture, and you are uh, at the same time you're learning together and upskilling, um, bringing every team, everybody at the same level. Yeah. So to add to that, for my perspective, yeah, I think like for us, we, we got to a certain point, we got to the cloud every year. We know how to run holiday. We know how to measure our services and, and all those things. And then it becomes probably kind of what you're touching on, Steve, right? What is your associate satisfaction, right? Or, or do you look at toil ratio? How much are you spending on processes? How much are you doing repetitive tasks, right? What's your quality of life, right? Are you able to deploy at night or during the day? You know, all those kind of factors probably start to have more weighting than they maybe did before right in in your journey so yeah probably the maturity matrix in that in that case is you know are you still able to, to achieve what you need to achieve then are, how well are you doing it right and how can we improve in some of those areas right and looking at automate first kind of thing and you know that associate satisfaction right as well absolutely agree um well, well there's a joke that um there's a lot of teams that you know, we're called sysadmins, and then they they all got renamed to DevOps, and then then they got all renamed to SREs. Right. Um, and an alternative to, to that joke is that they all got renamed the platform team. Um, maybe that goes in the middle somewhere. I'm not really sure. Um, but like, sure, totally true. Like yeah. everyone does this. Um, but but one thing that is um, I really like about the the term platform team uh, as, as as it relates to, to SRE is um, a lot of what you can call the the platform for your team or your org is really just a, a set of capabilities that are enshrined in, in code, right? And they're they're either like tools you bought, you know, off the shelf or like, you know, tools you, you downloaded off GitHub or something like that, or like stuff you wrote or shell scripts, or it's even can be like documentation, like here's how we do the thing. Um, and by enshrining these things in your platform, you're able to do stuff that you couldn't really do before, or you're able to um, take like, uh, learnings from from failure, like through the postmortem process, you're able to just determine like, oh, next time we have one of these things, we should definitely do the thing first. Um, and you're able to enshrine these all into a system that can in time be automated and can be applied to, to more and more of your organization, of your team. So uh, if you follow this approach and you uh, enshrine these best practices and these learnings into a platform that is like usable by many people, um, you can kind of, you kind of get a couple great um, outputs from this. One of them is that obviously the teams who, who are using it every day can continue to use it and operate on it and et cetera. But the other thing is that you can have latecomers who just show up and they get all of the good stuff, right? They're just like, if you have like uh, one really good model is if you are starting to build a cloud platform, uh, don't start <laughs> by putting your most important thing on it first. Like don't put the, mo the thing that makes the money, like don't have that be your guinea pig. Bad idea, right? Uh, you do the thing that you can turn off and it's not a big deal. So everyone kind of gets this, I think. But like, if you do this a bunch of times, you get the point where your platform has a bunch of this reliability, resilience capabilities built into it. And then you can be like, okay, like money bags, come on over. Like, and that team comes over and they, they migrate onto it. And all of a sudden they have a ton of capabilities. And so they've gone from like, quote, immature, like over on the old system, and they've just adopted a bunch of new practices that are enshrined in the platform. And some of it's documentation and some of it is like procedures. And it's like, here's how you hold the knob and here's what you do. But like they get to inherit a bunch of this stuff really quick. And it's because you're uh, you're writing software, basically. Some of it's, yeah, some of it's documentation, but like you're, you're writing stuff down that other people can use. Um, this, I think, is like one of the core essences of SRE is like, take a best practice abstracted enough where someone else can use it, right? This, this is writing libraries, basically, or, 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 or shared services, or, or playbooks, right? Um, like one of the early things that SRE did really well, I think, which sounds kind of silly, was we made one escalation system and one way to page somebody, right? So there, like this was before PagerDuty or anything existed. And like when you made a new service, it used to be you just kind of like, well, how do we find out when it's broken? <laughs> you know, like we had what we, we, we built a common monitoring paging escalation system. And it's like everybody just used this one. And that just freed up a bunch of cognitive load for everybody else. And they all got to use it. And then whenever someone would make one change to that thing, everyone benefits, right? It's like the raises all ships kind of thing. 
So uh, I think this model is really powerful. And I don't think it really comes across in the books very well. Like it's one of these things about like, like it's actually buried more in like app modernization tomes these days. They talk more about platforms and things like that there. But I think it's really quite related to SRE as well. So once you once you have a place where you can put all this automation and you can put all of your like resilience into it, it, it really mean, means your migration of your services, whether you're coming from another cloud or you, whether you're coming to cloud for the first time or you're just changing the way you operate things on-prem, uh, they can all kind of like be, be raised together. And that, that's the place where you put all of your, your improvements over time. And so we had a couple of follow-up questions, I think, that we're talking about capabilities. I've heard implicitly in all of your answers a little bit of this. Um, the question was, what would the vectors be on the maturity curve? We're saying there's no maturity matrix, right? But there is, um, but we do want to, in one way or another, assess the performance of our SRE teams or our transition to SRE. I heard, uh, Randy mentioned, I think, reducing toil, right? Steve has talked about automating a lot of work, which maybe that's reducing toil, but also like enabling capabilities um, on their products and potentially other products. What other uh, vectors or categories or um, what other like columns are in your assessment for your SRE teams to, to determine if they're headed in the right direction. The one that is probably very subjective and hardest to measure is the culture shift, right? I mean, that definitely is the core of it. To take a bunch of DevOps engineers and, you know, kind of make them into something different than that, right? That definitely should have a way and, you know, there are all kinds of books out there and papers that will say how you measure things where there's no one size fits all, I'm sure. But I think every organization would probably have to measure that on the journey to say, are you making that shift? When you call it culture, lift, uh, culture uh, shift or shift left, whatever we want to call it, right? Because without that, I, you know, this is a hard enough gig to be. <laughs> if, if everybody isn't pulling in that direction, it's become that much more harder, right? the transformation journey would become that much harder. I, I definitely think that should be part of the measure. Right? I completely sure. agree with that. Yeah, that's like cultural shift. That, that's, that's a cornerstone for, for this one. To measure that, I, I would think as you mature in cloud journey, uh, uh, you basically, uh, you learn along the way. And how do you learn uh, is, is something like maybe you can measure based on how many certifications your teams are getting, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, and what kind of certifications are they still associated? Are they professional? Like, are they getting at the level where where they should be uh, at a certain point of time, right? So those may be a good uh, measuring uh, vectors, uh, in my opinion. Like, uh, if you uh, start rewarding and and start uh, promoting that uh, learning culture and measuring in terms of certification that your 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 associates are getting. I think for me, yeah, part of it is the culture, right? And kind of where I see the positive result of, you know, we had all the conversations for all the years, but when my partners, be it product or development, start coming to me and say, hey, we just had an incident, can you do BPM? I'm like, well, here's a link, you can go start it, right? So that, that's part of it, right? Where they're asking us, or our product is like, hey, you know, what's the reliability? They're asking those questions that we used to ask and they didn't know the context of why we were asking them, but our partners are now asking for us to do it. And then we're turning it back. I'm turning it back on them to say, well, how about you, right? Do that, right? How, how about we go on that journey together, right? Instead of me pushing, it's, it's more collaborative. It's a tough thing to measure, right? I agree. But yeah, the culture shift is, is definitely a tremendous part of it, right? If, if we're all on the same page and kind of speaking that same, language about hey have you guys done your ARR and your DTs are you ready to go to production now what's your SLOs right and everybody's like yeah got it got it got it right yeah and they're right there with you but yeah it's hard to measure but if everybody's on board then you've gotten there right great so I think we have time for one last question here and then we're gonna turn it over to um, 
to time to network. Um, so last question here from Scott. Uh, with applications that are dependent on lower level services that are multi-use, how do you structure SLOs? Should they be based on how my application performs? Are downstream applications responsible for identifying SLOs to fit within the same constraints? How do people feel about this? I would think like it's a, depending on what the nature of the downstream services that you depend on. For example, I'll give you an example from my side. Uh, in, in, uh, in our cloud chain, we built an API, for example, for provisioning a particular service, let's say I am rollover server. Uh, if that service is in the mix of a highly rated application, like if that is a highly rated application depends on, on my API, and my API is not uh, the same as uh, same uh, tier as the upstream uh, app is. So I would expect that upstream applications should code accordingly, defensively, like I introduce uh, retriability or, or or something like that. So that 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 way you are. If my API is down, you can still get to get over your uh, whatever infrastructure work you're doing uh, um, by doing retries or defensive programming, right? Uh, Having said that, uh, I cannot have my application, uh, like all the infrastructure related API at the same tier as the, let's say, dollar running uh, APIs, right? So that's where the, the, the dependency, I think the type of dependency really matters. For example, if I'm at the, uh, if I'm not infrastructure API, I'm, I'm also revenue generating API, probably I'll have, I'll have to match this hello for whatever uh, the upstream or downstream APIs are. But I would think like based on the type of uh, dependency that matters here to define that uh, that value, like what what to match it or you you ask them ask upper up upstream APIs to defensively program against lower tier. Um, we we've had in the past um, the the concept of like safe handling instructions. Um, so if someone has a multi-multi-multi-user multi, multi, I don't know, multi backend service of some kind, they'd say like, "This is this is our sort of like agreement. Like our SLOs look like this. Like the, our service acts in this way. If you expect something different, like be prepared to not get you know the expectation. You know, don't don't expect to get the, the SLOs you want. Um, in particular, if you use it in this way, like it will break 100%. Like uh, sort of like uh, the the ability to um, like a have a conversation with your the teams that depend on you and b be able to like publish the outcomes of those conversations to like future teams who want to depend on you in the future is super super important so that way can someone can show up and be like well let's use this data source I bet it's great and they look at your documents and they're like oh they only use you know, support like you know reads of some length or whatever but, but I bet it's okay if we read really long blobs instead of really short blobs. I bet it'll be just fine. And if they have a little thing like, absolutely do not use like long blobs in here, like that would be bad. And you would you can expect the following outcome. That's a good defensive mechanism because you can tell people like, you know, we have this SLO. If you stray from it, or if you stray from these like, you know, this lighted path, you won't get the SLO. And then the last element here is like, if someone comes to you and be like, yo, I'm super important. I'm that new product that just launched. Like, you definitely need to, like, do what I say because, you know, the boss says that I'm great. Then um, there's totally ways to do that, right? Like, so as the backend blob hosting service, you can be like, okay, so you want to do this crazy thing. We're going to give you, like, a special copy of us that's over here, right? And we're going to give you a different address, a different, you know, serving path or something like that. And you can call us this way and we're going to change the way we do things in the background to like manage that but like we're going to name it differently it's going to be like you know blob reader dash long or something like that and it's going to have a different slo it's going to have different semantics and we're going to have a different page that's like you're allowed to make calls here for this type of and so so basically what you're doing is you're you're taking your service and you're just doing microservices right like you're you're you're, you're looking at the the interface between your customer team and yourself and if it doesn't match you you spawn a little you know sub process and you say like go over here instead where the semantics are different uh, and then you can manage these two things separately from each other and um, when one fails the other ones don't and all that stuff so so you have a lot of options there when it comes to uh, but but the, the point of that though is uh, 
communication, right? So you got to be able to publish what to expect and people need to be able to read the, like, is it working right or not? And they need to be able to come to you and say like, can we do something differently? Pretty please. And then you can say, you know, yes or no, depending on however you make decisions. So that's, that's like the abstract framework I would use. Uh, remember it's all software. You can, you can change it. You can make more services. It doesn't cost very much. So um, that's, that's my, my advice. I feel like it doesn't cost very much as a, a trick. <laughs> no, just create a service. Like it's just all, the, it's all the relative. creating a service shouldn't yes. cost very much, but you're yeah. right. The managing the services definitely costs a lot. Great. You strike that from the record. I apologize. <laughs> I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to call you out. I just, I, I just thought it was. Fun. No, I love it. Please do. Please do. Um, cool. Well, to Walker, Randy, Steve, Ash, thank you for being good sports, coming and talking with me. Um, at this point, I'll uh, hand it back over to Jim. Yes, <laughs> and not just uh, not just a thank you to uh, to our panelists. To say their names one more time, uh, DeWalker, Ash, Randy, and Steve, it's been a pleasure having you. Eric, thanks for uh, agreeing to give us a little insight into SRE uh, from your perspective and then lead the uh, lead the conversation here. Uh, a lot of personal messages, uh, direct messages that it's uh, been a good session, uh, a good session for people. So this ends our, our first half. Uh, it's not it's not equidistantly half, you know, the back half will be a little bit shorter. Uh, but thank you, everybody. Uh, the next section, uh, after a short break, uh, short five minute break, if you'd like to stick around, we'll try and do some virtual networking. I'll make everybody uh, presenter so they can bring, turn their mic and, and, uh, and camera on. Uh, please consider joining us uh, again. Keep an eye on our, our page for the events that are, uh, that are coming up. Uh, and yeah, thank you everybody, uh, all the panelists, and we'll be back in five minutes for a, a little bit of virtual networking. Thank you. A little round of, round of applause for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.